Hi everyone, so today we're gonna to talk about a really beautiful question and over here we're gonna look at how we can prove an identity on floor functions. Now when it comes to the greatest integer function, there are a couple of things that you, couple of identities really that you should be aware of. Um, some of the basic ones uh, are there obviously, but then there are others like Hermite identity. And um, really in math limpet contest, they ask you to prove certain relatively unknown identities of course um so this is a classic example of that it's an IMO problem and it's just a really beautiful example of um, how doing a little bit of analysis on the floor function can actually lead us to certain interesting results that we can keep in mind for future applications while also solving the problem at hand right so without wasting any time let's just get right into it this is the problem number six from the IMO in the year 1968 and in this video we're going to be looking at uh, proving a floor function identity then we're looking at an interesting result. Uh, we're obviously going to learn how to telescope with floor functions. A little bit of telescoping series involved as well. Then we have some book sessions for CDM at Olympiads. And at the this is the problem number six from the IMO in the year 1968. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, Computer Science and Informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. So prove the following identity for all natural numbers. And, and as you can see, we have the floor functions involved as well. So this is a very classic identity and uh, it works for all natural numbers. And so it really is an identity in its full glory, right? So yeah, let's get into it. So if you actually notice something, um, Let's just notice the first term. If I really split up the first term, it is nothing but n by 2 plus 1 by 2. Right? Okay, great. What's the second term? Well, it is n by 2 squared plus 1 by 2. Right? So, and this just goes all the way up till n by 2 raised per n plus again 1 by 2 over here is equal to n. So, we are really considering a certain quantity, whether that is n by 2, n by 2 square or whatever, plus 1 half. Right? So we should really be analyzing something. Let's let's do some analysis. And what shall we analyze? We shall analyze this quantity x plus one half and the floor of it, obviously. And the reason for it is pretty simple, as um, you can see over here as well. We have some quantity x n by two raised power m for some m plus one half. So there's always one half added to some particular uh, quantity, right? So maybe it's a good idea to analyze this floor of x plus one half. And we have done certain similar things for a lot of the Putnam problems that I've covered. So you can check them out as well. Okay, great. So um, how can we maybe explore this a little bit? So I'm gonna use uh, maybe a little notation. So any integer really x or any, any non-integer as well, any real number can really be represented as m plus epsilon, where m is a natural number and epsilon is obviously between zero and one you know we essentially write it as x is equal to the floor of x plus the fractional part of x and this is really just another way to write it so in this case the floor of x becomes m and the fractional part becomes epsilon i'm not using floor and fractional just because just to avoid certain confusion because you already have floor in the question as well right so i'll use this definition i'll use this notation that x is m plus epsilon epsilon and this is applicable for any real number x okay great so the floor of x plus one half really becomes the floor of m plus epsilon plus one half cause x is m plus epsilon. Now, since m is an integer, it comes out of the floor, right? That's a very, that's one of the most basic properties of floor function. If it is, if you have an integer inside, it just comes out, right? So m plus in the floor, we have epsilon plus one half. Now let's just maybe analyze two cases. So case one will be where this epsilon is between zero and one half, one half not included. And the second case will be where this epsilon is between one half and one, right? Because really it has to be between zero and one, right? So if epsilon is between zero and one half, epsilon plus one half will be between one half and one. But essentially the floor of epsilon plus one half rather will be equal to zero. Because epsilon plus one half is something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, so on and so forth. Somewhere between 0 0.5 and one. So this floor will be zero. So basically the floor of X plus one half which we saw earlier was equal to m plus the floor of epsilon plus one half. When well, the floor of epsilon plus one half is zero, so the floor of x plus one half simply becomes equal to m. Right, that's just amazing. Let's just maybe analyze case number two over here. 
case number two. So in case one, we really considered epsilon between zero and one half. Well, second case is pretty much similar. Epsilon between one half and one. One obviously not included because of the, otherwise it would just become an integer. But okay, in this scenario, epsilon plus one half is between one and 1.5, right? So three by two actually. So basically the floor of epsilon plus one half will in this case be equal to one because it can be something like 1.1, 1.2, 1.25, 1.3, .1 something around something around that, right? So the floor of x plus one half, which was equal to m plus the floor of epsilon plus one half, in this scenario, the floor of x plus one half actually becomes m plus one. So we have quite an interesting result from concluding those, these two cases. So in case number two, we're getting m plus one, but in case number one, we're getting m, right? So essentially, the floor of x plus one half is either m or m plus one, depending upon the value of the fractional part of x, right? That's pretty, pretty interesting result. Now let's maybe take this a little bit further. Let's further analyze this. So if you remember, x was m plus epsilon, right? So let me just double this. 2x will be 2m plus 2 times epsilon, right? Or in other words, the floor of 2x will be floor of 2m plus 2 times epsilon. Well, awesome. So the floor of 2x will be 2m plus the floor of 2 epsilon. Because 2m is an integer, 2m also an integer, it just comes out, right? So um, we have this floor of 2x is equal to 2m plus floor of 2 epsilon. Now again, we're just gonna split this up into two cases, case one and case two. Case one, like before, epsilon between zero and one half. So in this case, twice of epsilon becomes between zero and one. So therefore the floor of two epsilon is obviously equal to zero. So like we were seeing before, the floor of two X was equal to two M plus four floor of two epsilon. But since floor of two epsilon is zero, the floor of two X really just becomes equal to two M. And that is the result that we get from case number one over here. So case number one, we consider epsilon between zero and one half. Like before case number two, let's consider epsilon between one half and one. So in this case, twice of epsilon be becomes between one and two. So it's clear to see that the floor of two epsilon is one. Now, if you remember, we had the floor of two X is equal to two M plus floor of two epsilon. Well, the floor of two epsilon is equal to one. So this is two M plus one. So what are we realizing over here? We realize, we're realizing that in one case we get 2m plus 1 and in the other case we get 2m. So the floor of 2x is really either 2m or 2m plus 1. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of insight, a little bit of backdrop into what exactly is happening over here. So if you actually notice, if you actually observe what we've done till now, we've really established a couple of things, right? First we saw that the floor of x plus 1 half is either m or m plus 1. The second thing that we saw is that the floor of 2x is either 2m or 2m plus 1. Well, the key thing is that this plus 1 is constant. So either we have m plus 0 or 2m plus 0 or we have m plus 1 or 2m plus 1. So the constant terms are in a way fixed. The really only thing that is changing in these two things is m or 2m and again over here m or 2m. The constants, well, we have plus zero over here, plus zero over here, and plus one and plus one. That is essentially the same. So, so, so I can effectively conclude that the floor of 2x is equal to the floor of x plus one half plus a quantity m, right? Because x plus one half, floor of x plus one half can be either m or m plus one. And in any of these cases, we'll just add m, you'll get 2m or 2m plus one, which is what we were getting for floor of 2x from our uh, case analysis, right? So till now we have this fascinating result. We have this beautiful result that actually works for all real numbers X. And that is why it is such an interesting result, right? We've established such a cool little trick. And that is the floor of two X is equal to the floor of X plus one half plus the floor of X. And well, I here wrote M, but if you actually remember, if you actually remember, let's go back a little bit. Where were we? Let's go back. Yes. Well, X was M plus epsilon naught. Epsilon, right? So the floor of X was equal to M. Like I said over here as well, M is really nothing but the floor of X, right? M is the floor of X. Remember that? So over here, well, I'm just writing M as floor of X. And that is why we get this very, very, very important result. 
floor of 2x is equal to floor of x plus 1 half plus the floor of x. Or in other words, I can really just write that the floor of x plus 1 half is equal to the floor of 2x minus floor of x, which actually looks much better. Right? It actually looks a lot more aesthetically pleasing. Right? Floor of 2x minus floor of x is actually another floor quantity. It's just amazing. Right? But why did I do this? Well, if you actually look in the question, like I was saying at the very beginning, we have some quantity x plus one half, some quantity x plus one half, some quantity x plus one half, and we need to prove that it's actually equal to n. So now we can use a little bit of telescoping, can't we? Right? So in the question, in the question, we need to prove, we need to prove that the summation of m is equal to one to n of the floor of n by two to the power m plus one half is equal to n. If you just write down the given question in summation form, you'll get this. And m, like we've seen before, runs from one to n, obviously. We need to prove this. So, well, um, if you look at this quantity, this quantity is just some x. It's just some value of x which keeps on changing. X is a variable and this also keeps iterating from 1 to n. Right? So essentially, I'm going to replace this quantity over here with this minus this. Right? So effectively, look over here. So n by 2 raised power m plus 1 half, I can write that as the floor of 2 times that value. So this becomes 2 times n by 2 raised power m minus that value x itself so this just becomes n by 2 raised power m so really floor of n by 2 raised power m plus 1 half this just becomes floor of n by 2 raised power m minus 1 plus minus actually i beg your pardon minus floor of n by 2 raised power m okay awesome and then just let's put just let's just put the summation sign on both sides so um to prove again to prove summation from m is equal to 1 till n of floor of n by 2 raised to the power m plus 1 half is equal to m which suffices to prove that the right hand side which is equal to this quantity is equal to n right so essentially um, summation from m is equal to 1 till n of floor of n by 2 raised to the power m minus 1 minus the floor of n by 2 raised to the power m and this entire quantity is obviously under summation is equal to n so we just need to prove this little thing and it's actually very easy to see because this telescopes directly you know it's not even some not, not even some manipulation that you need to do it just telescopes very directly when you plug in value of m so let's just plug in certain values of m and see how this looks like right so this just looks like the floor of n by 2 raised power 0 because you plug in m is equal to 1 minus floor of n by 2 well you plug in uh, m is equal to 1 so you get um m is equal to 2, I'm sorry. So you get the floor of n by 2 raised power 1 over here. And um, over here, you get floor of n by 2 squared. Well, now you put n is equal to 2, or n is equal to 3 rather. And then you will get the floor of n by 2 squared minus floor of n by 2 cubed. 2 cubed. And then you put um, n is equal to 4, I guess. m is equal to 4, you will get n by 2 cubed minus floor of n by 2 raised power 4 and actually, if you actually notice something this goes on and on and on on and on and on up till this quantity n by 2 raised power n because m is running from 1 to n right and this like very easy to see this telescope because so these and these terms cancel out well this and this cancels out this and this cancels out so all of the diagonal elements are really getting cancelled so the diagonal elements keep on getting cancelled and what is left is essentially the first term and the last term so when you really sum all of these quantities you are getting the summation from m is equal to 1 to n of the floor of n by 2 raised power m plus 1 this is actually equal to the floor of n by 2 raised power 0 which is the floor of n plus the floor of n by 2 raised power n now it is very easy to see that 2 raised power n is greater than n for all n belongs to natural numbers and you can just prove that very easily you can do it by induction but i'll just make a simple claim for here n 2 raised power n you plug in n is equal to 1 you get 2 n is equal to 2 you get 4 n is equal to 3 you get 8 so really n by 2 raised power n is what it's either 1 by 2 um, over here it's 2 by 4 over here it's 3 by 8 and so on and so forth but really essentially floor of n by 2 raised power n is always equal to 0 and you can just observe over here or you can prove via induction and we've actually done this exact thing before i i guess in one of the videos so uh, 2 raised power n is strictly greater than n for all n belongs to natural numbers so um, when you take the floor of this quantity, this entire thing actually becomes zero. So well, 
the summation from m is equal to 1 to n of the floor of n by 2 raised per m plus 1 half is actually equal to the floor of n but since n is a natural number floor of n is just equal to n and hence we have proved our given claims and this actually works for all n belong to natural numbers so beautiful question beautiful telescoping that we saw and a very interesting result actually a very aesthetically pleasing result that you can keep in mind um, that is the floor of 2x minus the floor of x is equal to floor of x plus one half i guess that's a little bit easier to remember in this form as well right so hope you learned something from that and hope you liked it quite a bit okay so we have some book sessions for senior math olympiads i am a compendium polynomials by barbeo elementary number three by sipinski graph theory by harari combinatorics by brualdi secrets and inequalities and functional equations and how to solve them by christopher g small okay so at the end we have a similar but challenging problem and this is a quite an interesting question about um, uh, the floor functions right so you'll have to give this a little bit thought you'll have to explore it quite a bit in many of the questions that look really complicated and involve certain very weird kind of looking numbers the best way to go about these problems is just to consider certain small cases or just to consider certain simple case and then explore how these cases are actually looking like we did in the in this given problem we actually explored how this quantity x plus one half looks like and then we arrived at a very interesting result we arrived at a very important identity involving floor function that you should probably keep in mind for further applications right um, so maybe try and doing doing something similar with this and uh, if you're able to do it let me know until then i'll see you in the next video thank you very much and bye bye chinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics and they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training individual evaluation and remedial sessions the reason chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real olympiads from leading universities in india united states and europe some of our students come back to teach at chinta from oxford cambridge harvard mit ucla isi cmi iits tifr and iisc for more information visit chinta.com